Okay. Are you ready? I am ready. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Good day, radio listeners. Welcome to this edition of the Pure Sex Radio Broadcast. We're glad to have you here with us. My name is Jonathan. I'm here with Stephen Cervantes. How are you, my friend? I am blessed. Glad to be here. I'm ready to go to work. Awesome. And I'm excited, too, because, uh, and I want us to just dive in, because I love it whenever we have these conversations about our gateway workshop and just the things that these guys uh, share with us that they allow us to use on the radio program because man there's just such uh i don't know there's just such a richness to what these guys are willing to share because they've experienced something that uh, sadly is so unique in our in our world today and that is an environment where men can get just bare-boned authentic with one another and it's sad to say that that's not a common thing in the church that we we don't have enough environments like that but oftentimes out of this then there's just these these things that come out of these guys that we think well man that is that is rich that's gold that's uh, yeah insightful and so then we ask permission all the time can we use that no names ever mentioned right but every gateway man blesses another gateway man if you've ever attended and even if you're not a gateway man, if you're a man, these men are speaking to bless your lives, and they give us permission. And it is powerful when men get together and have a safe place to tell their stories. And when you tell your story and it comes out, mm-hmm. something happens, right? Amen. So so here's the first one I wrote, and I thought it was so powerful. I was, okay, so let me back up before I say the first one. We have a friend named Lee Presley. Preston. <laughs> like I said, he's a great friend. What's his I name? I mean, he's he, he's as legendary as, as a Presley, like an Elvis Presley. <laughs> well, I but, that. Uh, yeah, so, right. okay, make it the blooper. Or it's no? a, it's a, <laughs> we're a grace-based ministry. Thank you so much. I am going to send so. this to Lee, though. He'll love that. <laughs> so we, we work together. I don't know how I messed up his name, but great guy, Lee. I'm not going to say anymore. Uh, and he has this statement. He says, if a man says, oh, my parents were perfect— That man doesn't know where he came from. He Mm. doesn't know his own story. He doesn't know himself. Oh, no, my parents were great. They were wonderful people. And we're not talking in a general setting. We're talking in a please explain your parents to us in a group, men talking to men. And Oh, and, wonderful. And realize the context in which we're doing this at the Gateway Workshop is men who are carrying deep sexual brokenness. Right. So it's, it's you know... There's a different, I don't want to say a different kind of history, but there's a deeper history there than just, hey, kind of your common Oh, yes, yeah, so you had a talk social about, gathering, right, a so little flipping, how are you, fine, fine, fine. We're not no. just saying, hey, like, what did your parents do for a living? We're talking about, hey, let's talk about your family dynamic. Yes, and so when Lee says, if a man says, wonderful, great, church leaders, perfect, he says, the more you say wonderful about them, the more ignorant you are about yourself and your family. And so compare that to the statement, well, my dad had some strengths and my dad had some weaknesses. If a man says that, he knows his story. He knows his father. He knows his father had strengths and weaknesses, and he was raised under the strengths of his father and the weaknesses of his father. And I say about my father, at just the right time, my father covered me. When I did a stupid thing, my father showed up, and he, he, he stood in the gap for me. That's the strength of my father. Now, do you have weaknesses? Yeah, he had weaknesses. He didn't talk to us much. We were left in darkness a lot of the time. We didn't know life. And my brother and I tried to figure it out. But do I love my dad? I absolutely love my dad. Mm-hmm. Forgive my dad? Sure. But do I think he's some perfect? No. And right. I think he's some devil. No. He was just a man with strengths and weaknesses. Now, you understand what I just said about my father. Now, I want to read a statement a man made at the, re- at the weekend, and I want you to think about what it means. Because it doesn't fall exactly in this wonderful, perfect parent paradigm, but it's very insightful. And so I'm going to read it. He said, well, I knew they were my parents, I just didn't know them personally. Hmm. Wow. Well, what do you think about that? Well, you know, it's interesting because the idea behind this, we have heard countless times in, in our workshop. 
But this might be the first time I've ever heard it said in that specific way. Yes. And so I think it hit me in a whole new way when I first read this, when you brought it in, because I was thinking, well, yeah, 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 I, I, I totally get what he's saying here. But man, we've never heard it said that way. This idea that I, I knew the position that these individuals yes. held in my life. The titles. Yeah. The labels. The role that they played. Yes. I just didn't know the people. <laughs> you know? I shook my head. I, you know, when, when, at your response, I shook my head because it struck you like it struck me. And so what does that mean? Parents were very private. We had our conversations in the other room. We didn't argue in front of the children. We didn't say hard things. We just said light things. Uh, we didn't work through problems in front of our children so they could see us, our strengths and weaknesses going back and forth. We knew they were the leaders and we followed the rules. Mm -hmm. But did dad sit down with me? You know, I have this one thought. I don't care that my dad was not perfect. I only wish he would have told me about himself and what he knew about life and what confused him about life. Mm. Just tell me what you know, Dad, and I'll build the rest in. But to not tell me anything, to, to let me figure it out on my own, that's what he's saying. You never told me your stories. You never told me your struggles. You never told mm. me what you wanted and how your dreams came true or failed to get come true or you know, what your uh, regrets in life were and what overwhelms you and what scares you. You know, this hit me, this hit me pretty strongly uh, even just recently because I just uh, recently went to my uncle's funeral. And when we were walking away from the graveside, my son and I were walking to the car and the rest of the family was kind of following behind. And, uh, and we started talking about this idea of, you know, what do you want? to be said about you. And one of the things he says, he says, well, Dad, have you ever thought about what you want on your tombstone? And I said, well, you know, I've never actually thought about what I want on my tombstone, but I have thought about what I want my eulogy to be or my obituary to be. And so we started talking about that. And I think the thing that struck my son was when I said, you know, I, I don't want my obituary just to have a bunch of dates and facts. I said, if that's all that I end up leaving behind, then I feel like I've kind of failed as a person. Mm. And I think he, I think it, it resonated with him because he was really, because he and I, we have these man meetings, we meet, and I try my best to like pour into his life so that he knows what I was like at his age. He knows that I was once a child, that I was once a teenager, all these kinds of things. Mm. And my hope is that that never be a statement that he makes. And, and so it really hit me kind of hard, and I realized there, there are a lot of folks that that was their experience growing up, mm -hmm. that they knew the positions of everybody, siblings too. Right. But that didn't necessarily mean they knew the person. Well, and think about it. You could have flagged your son off and said, I'm sad right now, son. I don't want to talk about it, son. Don't, right. No, I don't want to think. I don't want to think about death, you know. But you said, well, let me tell you what my thinking is. May not get it all out perfect, son, but I'm, I want you to know what I'm thinking. Well, and I was, I felt like it was, it was insightful on his part to ask the question about Absolutely. the tombstone. So I didn't want to, I'm not going to dismiss that when he's actually thinking about it. No, too, he's you know? <laughs> looking at all these tombstones and he's reading all these stones and there's words on all these stones and he's not going to die first. You are, at least in theory. Right. So what would you want? Because did you get to see the uncle's headstone or no, it was covered? Not yet. In, I mean, yeah, yeah. Okay. So well, we had other family members in that cemetery. So, so we were able to go around. You look at those He stones? was able to go around and there see my go. dad's tombstone his his great grandparents and, and so and anyway. so such a natural just such a, a moment right where a boy is open and his father can step in but do you understand the reason your son can ask you that is because you've given him permission mm -hmm. you've set this up many of us would not have asked our fathers that question oh yeah well and here's they the would not we would not to have wanted to see our fathers uncomfortable right so we protected them and say just don't talk. 
Yeah. And the thing I would say to our listeners on this note is this is not about trying to produce guilt or shame in anybody. No. For, you know, because I'm sure there's parents and grandparents mm-hmm. out there that they hear this and they go, my kids and my grandkids could say that about me. And instead of responding with guilt or shame, the hope is that we can say, hey, as long as there's breath in your body, yeah. you can make changes. And, Start now. And, and here's the thing I would say, the simplest, the simplest way to make a correction on this is to simply start telling your kids or your grandkids your story. Just yes. tell them your story. A story. You know? Stories, yeah. right? Any story of when you were a kid, stories about what happened. And not just, okay, uh, we didn't have color TVs. Not just facts. No, but like... But how you dealt with life right. stories. I feel like when when I hear my kids repeating to each other and others stories of me and my sister growing up or stories of things that happened between me and my parents, when I hear them repeating those stories, I feel like, okay, well, I I, I may feel like I'm completely inadequate as a dad, but maybe they're getting to know me. Yes, you know what I mean? Cause, yes. So I think one indication that maybe your kids are not just knowing you as their parents, but are knowing you personally is when you hear them repeating your stories. Like, oh, do you remember the time that you and Shannon did da-da-da-da? Or, hey, do you remember the time when you and Grandma did blah blah It's That's like, great. then you realize it's not just about them being in a position in the home, yes. but there's actually a relationship being built there. And so I, I want to encourage parents and grandparents out there, hey, listen, you're you're obviously alive because you're listening to this program. Right. So maybe a phone call's in order or a visit or oh, just something great. to start sharing your stories. To open that up and to be that kind of person that can can talk about, look, life is a struggle and we're all struggling. And if I can help you on the journey, why not pass that information to someone younger and help exactly, them? Exactly, yeah. So that's exciting. I appreciate that. So number two comment, why... Why, why is it so hard for me to like me? Mm. Why is it so hard for me to like myself? Your thought? Oh, man. I've, I've, I had wrestled and still to some degree will wrestle with this, this question. It was really, really bad during my addicted years. Um, and, and the shame really took me down hard in that. Um, I just think this is one of those things where if you don't have a secure sense of your identity as a child of God, then you're going to just bounce all over the place in terms of being able to know how to express appropriate affection toward yourself. And I use that I say that carefully in terms of appropriate affection toward yourself, because I think we have a ton of inappropriate affection that's going on in our culture towards self that is born out of this idea of wanting to like yourself, but not understanding your identity Mm. as it is from your creator. Because there's a a whole lot going on in our culture about, you know, liking yourself, right? To the point that's uh, obsessive and decadent. I mean, oh, I mean, make it all about me and my happiness and yeah. pleasure, you're saying. And so I think one of the reasons why it's so hard for me to like me is because maybe all of my efforts to like me out of a proper understanding of my identity in, my, in relationship to my creator is just going to leave me empty. So all the things that I pursue— Say that again. So all uh-huh. the things that I pursue to, to like me— Oh, Okay outside of understanding my identity mm-hmm. related to my creator, it's always going to end up futile, right? Yes. It's going to end up empty and vain. And uh, that's why you hear so many times of the people that quote unquote make it to the top find themselves incredibly lonely, right. incredibly empty. Because it's like, well, that didn't really, hey, I made life all about me, crushed a lot of people along the way. And for some reason, I'm not satisfied. So why is it so hard for me to like me? One, I think, is that shame dialogue where we say hard things about ourselves and we just repeat them over and over again. Number two, I think 
it's hard for me to like me because I know my own limitations. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know my failures, but that's different. I tried things and failed. But I also know that I really do have certain limitations. Oh, yeah. I'm not good at certain things, and other people are good at certain things. And so if I see myself by my limitations and I have no vision, no one speaks over me saying, you know what, you could be a really good attorney or preacher or teacher. You could be really good at social work. You could be a really good accountant. Nobody gives you vision. You've got to figure it out on your own. And so wouldn't you say it took a long time for you to find a place because you didn't have much vision, mm-hmm. you knew your limitations, you knew your failures. How well, I long think, did it take for you to find a place that you could say, whoa, I could be good at this, I am good at this, I'm designed for this. Wow, this is where God has me. Now I can be nicer to me because I found my place. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where... Uh, I think I still go through that about every five years. <laughs> <laughs> Where you're like, still. what's next? I mean, what what am I going to be good? At? But I think um, I like what you said about vision, and the thing that came to my mind was blessing. That's another thing that I think is missing. If yes. we don't have that blessing that says, "Hey, listen, oh. in your limitations, in your you know boundaries that are natural, yeah. um, you're enough." There's a blessing there, and I think yes. we need to receive that from our fathers. Mothers are good too, but I think if we if we don't get that blessing, mm. then it's hard for us to be secure in that identity that we've been given from our Creator. Because I love the fact that you you acknowledge that we have limitations. That's another thing that I think has gone you know nuts so in our culture is the idea that if you dream it, you can do it. Well, that's baloney. Yeah, right. <laughs> I dream all the time that I can fly without an airplane. I can't do that, you know. So yeah. we have to recognize there are natural limitations to yes. even our ability. But can we be okay with our design mm. in those limitations? And and that we have if a somebody's place. not speaking a blessing over that, along with giving vision, mm. then a lot of times we are fumbling around for a long time and. Um, and that kind of gets back to one thing we talked in a previous program about putting putting men around us, people yes. around us, who are going to be able to give us that perspective. Because thankfully, you know, see, my dad died when I was eighteen, so the the one who seemed the most naturally positioned to be able to give me that blessing and vision mm. was no longer with me after that point in time. But thankfully, God brought along other men mm. that were able to speak into my life and say, "Hey, you know what? You're." You're really, you're really a good speaker. You're really built for this, and and you have a story to tell. And I think you need to tell. You know, to be able to have that, then is really what launched me into ministry. And now I feel like I'm very much doing what I was designed in to your do. zone, yeah. right? This is good. But what do you tell your son? How old is your son now? Fifteen. And so, what do you say? I want to say thirteen. That's how far mine is. Right. Yeah. He he keeps growing. I know. You know? He keeps getting older. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, what do you tell him? His identity is. Well, um, I, I definitely always bring it back to Christ because, you know, he trusted Christ as a young boy. He was baptized some years ago. And so I want to make that the central thing, but also tell him that I'm proud of him as his father and that nothing can change that. I mean, I'm really, I try to be very specific about him recognizing that, listen, no matter how well he does, no matter how poorly he does. But what line does, do you literally say to him? What's a line that Gosh, man, he would remember that you go, I'm going to, I know I needed to hear this line from my father. Mm-hmm. You're a good son. You, um, That's you one know, that I use you fairly are, often. You, you were made in God's image. Mm-hmm. You have great worth. Because we know, what, uh, we know what shame says and false identity and all these critics have said, right? What is it that my father says, yeah. tells me who I am. And that one that you, you said is one that I use often. I used to say, you're a good boy. Yeah. And now it's more like, you're a good young man, you're a good son. Yeah. That's a phrase. I use that a lot. And, you know, for a while, I really, I, I it's funny because I think I struggled with that for a while. And the reason was because I'd get all, you know, super theological in my head. Right. So I'm like, well, even Jesus said, you know, why do you call me good? Why do you call me a good teacher? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, just let it, let's yeah. not get overly theological about this. Yeah. Yes, I understand that the Bible says there's nothing good in me, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But it's like, I'm his dad. I'm going to look at him 
And I don't think I'm telling him any falsehood by saying, you're a good young man. You know? Yeah. It's like, yeah, you could pick that apart theologically and try to make it seem like, well, now to the proper way to say that, but, but it's like, forget all that. I want him, to, because I think you're right. In this idea of why is it hard for me to like me, if if he can go through his life having his father's voice ring in his head, you're a good man. Yeah. That's probably going to keep him from saying, why is it so hard for me to like me? That's right. If you say you're good, you're good. And then every now and then you say, not perfect. But do you know you're good? Mm. Because you're made in the image of God. Yeah. Because his spirit abides in you. Because it's more you. statement of value you know than a behavior. you that you are yeah. good? That you're good. You're good. You should, you know, almost tell every your kid, you know, you're good. You're good. Because that's true identity, right? Absolutely. Because if we're made in the image of God... That's good. If his spirit abides in us, that's good. Right? Yeah. And what's the opposite? I'm a screw up. I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. I wish I was more. I wish I could be good. I wish you'd be good enough. Right? Those lies are the ones we want to say. Let me just tell you, I know you better than anybody else. Oh, yeah. Right? And you're good. And if you're listening right now and no one has ever told you that, I want to tell you, you're mm-hmm. good. Mm-hmm. You are good. Yeah. You are made in the image of the Father. His Spirit abides in you. And you are good. He delights in you. When he sees you, he smiles because he sees a reflection of himself. He sees good. Amen. And if no one has ever spoken that to you, let that be the line that quiets the critics. Because I'm speaking my spirit to your spirit. The God of the universe, the creator of all things, speaking now to you, saying, you are made in my image, he said. I have chosen you. I have blessed you. I know you. And I celebrate you because I see good, Mm God-likeness, good in you. And if you're if you're in a place where you're able to do this, if you're driving, obviously don't do this. But if you're in a place where you're able to do this, I would encourage you right now to just just open up your hands, mm. you know, lift them, open them up to, to the sky, open them up to the heavens, and just, mm. just receive that blessing that Stephen just spoke over you. Mm. Sometimes doing a physical gesture to, to acknowledge a blessing helps it remain more present in your being. It helps it to be absorbed more fully into your being rather than just mentally assenting to it. To do something physical, uh, I think, is an act of worship. And so maybe in this moment, it would be good for you to just open your hands and receive that blessing of goodness that Stephen has spoken over you. And may you just, may you hear it from your Father in heaven, because it's not Stephen's words. God is the one who declared from the very beginning when he looked at all of his creation and the crowning jewel mankind was made, and he said, it's very good. And so just receive that blessing now. That's good. So... The next comment that was made at one of our seminars was, um, I can build a great fantasy, and I can make it so real and so rich that I can get lost in it and spend all afternoon in the fantasy that I created. Mm. Is yeah. that amazing? Well, yeah, we're, we're incredibly creative creatures. And, um, and the thing is, when I, when I see this, you know, a lot of a lot of folks would be quick to go, stop it, <laughs> stop right? it, right? And you know what? It. I look at this and I say, the first thing I want this guy to hear is, you have a gift from God. Mm. That kind of creativity, that kind of imagination. Now he's going to probably go, what? Right. I mean, everything in that fantasy is lost. Going on, but I want him first to see that his ability to imagine and be creative in his mind is not in and of itself evil. Fantasy, creativity. The idea of imagination. Yes, imagination. And so the thing is, is because we're so quick to look at the sinful outcome yes. of where that imagination is pointed, that we go, stop it. And then he's starting to think, well, anything I imagine, any kind of... Mm. And we want to say, no, 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 there's a delineation point that you want to say, there's certain things on this side of the line of where my imagination goes that takes it into sinful territory, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. It's like, 
your imagination is God-given. It's part of bearing the image of God. He's a creator. He says, you're made in my image, therefore I'm going to give you creative capacity yes, in your imagination. Right. Mm. So I, I, I'm always careful when guys start talking about the elaborate fantasies of not letting them think that the ability to fantasize, the ability to create imaginatively is the problem. It's what the object right. of their creative imagination well, and is. The thought that occurs to me is the loss of time oh, yeah. and energy and effort. And so we want to celebrate that he's creative, but but the whole idea that he's built a place for his own personal entertainment. And it becomes so isolating, and too. That's right? right. Loss of energy and time and effort and isolating and about self and not accomplishing anything, mm-hmm. but just getting caught up. So I'm going to close with one comment. Uh, when my story is free, this guy said, when my story is free... This is what I've learned this weekend by telling my story. When my story is free, I am free. Mm. Yeah. The idea of your story being set free from darkness, from secrecy, from not being told. Uh, Because if you think about it, we we are our stories. Mm. We're living our story. And so I think whatever, I love what this man is saying, because basically what he's saying is whatever part of our story is continuing to be rem- remain hidden, it means that there's a part of myself that's still in bondage. There's a part of myself self that's still um, not in the light. And, you know, one of our core values is story. And so I want to encourage listeners out there, if, you, if you've not told your full story, then I encourage you to see a counselor or a pastor or get with a trusted friend that you can say, you know what, I, I want to set my story free yes. so that I can live in that freedom. And there's two things that occur to me. One, the story is held in child thinking because it happened to me as a kid and I still think of it as a kid. Mm-hmm. And until I bring it forward and really sort of talk and add my adulthood, it's an, a child story stuck in a child. And number one and number two, um, there's a lot of confusion, and when you tell a story, you have to put it in order so you get rid of confusion and child thinking, mm-hmm. and there's sort of a freeing freshness that happens when an old story that's hidden comes to light. Mm, yeah, and listeners, I also want to let you know that if you if you don't know where to turn to tell your story, that's what our ministry is here for. We want to help you tell your story and take some first steps on your next season of your journey. And we are grateful that you've been with us. That's all the time we have for this uh, program, but we hope that it's been helpful, and we look forward to having you back here again next time on the Pure Sex Radio broadcast. Take care. Thanks. God bless. Okay, man. We 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 knocked him out. We got done.